For much of the 1900s, pubs in the United Kingdom could only sell a particular brand of beer. They were tied, tied to a particular brewery, the end result of a widely profitable vertical integration move that created six British beer empires. The tied house system was an obvious monopoly, and in 1989, the British government broke it apart. What happened next is intoxicating. In today's video, we take a swig of the beer orders. As we embark on this video, I'm going to presume that you have a working knowledge of beer. The word pub is short for public houses. I actually never knew that before. Basically, pubs are establishments licensed to sell beer or other alcoholic beverages. They are descended from the alehouse, but are more of a social institution. This was because pubs were open to the public, unlike alehouses, and lacked accommodation, unlike inns. It is a place to relax and socialize. For this reason, most British beer is consumed outside of the home. Even today, 85% of UK beer is consumed at a licensed premise, which includes a pub. Since beer and alcohol are a lucrative revenue source for governments, pubs have been long the subject of licensing. The first dates back to 1495, when Henry VII gave any two magistrates the power to suppress an alehouse or pub. Magistrates are ordinary citizens who hear cases in their community. They are not the same as judges. However, when a magistrate granted a license to a pub, they were essentially giving this newly created pub a local monopoly to sell beer, and that opened the doors to corrupt collusion between the magistrates and the brewers. This monopoly power and corruption had serious repercussions. Local pub monopolies meant artificially high beer prices, when you pile on duties and taxes on top of that, then you start to get ordinary people riled up. Concerns over this corruption led to the Beer House Act of 1830. The act introduced, quote, free licensing, end quote, to the market, allowing people to purchase a pub license if they paid a sum to their local office. It was an extraordinarily controversial piece of legislation. The clergy hated the pubs, seeing them as centers of sin and crime. The ruling classes saw them as facilitating social unrest, particularly in the countrysides. But it passed, and we can demarcate the 1830 Act as the beginning of the modern British beer industry. In only six months after the Act's passing, 24,324 new pub licenses were granted in both the towns and countrysides. Interestingly enough, the actual amount of beer consumed, as measured by malt sales, did not increase as much. Just one big jump of 40% from 1829 to 1831, and then it plateaued from there. What this data point hinted at is that these new pubs frankly sucked, drawing criticism from local authorities. So 40 years later, in 1869, the UK passed the Wine and Beer House Act of 1869. It gave the magistrates the power to close, quote, low-quality pubs based on certain criteria. This seemingly innocuous 1869 law changed the relationship between the brewers and their retail pubs. Throughout the 1800s, beer brewing sprouted into a major business. New technologies like pasteurization and refrigeration made it possible for brewers to offer a standardized beer product. The United Kingdom of the 1800s was an exporting power, fueled by globalization slash colonization, railways, and the steam engine. Fueled by these drivers, the beer industry consolidated with bigger fish eating the smaller ones. In 1839, the United Kingdom had 48,636 brewers. By 1880, that number fell to 21,223. Now, it was a long-standing practice for brewers to secure their local markets using exclusive supply contracts with a retail pub, Tides. A pub that is so beholden to a brewer was called a Tide House. These ties exist in several forms, an exclusive beer supply contract, or loans made to the pub in exchange for beer exclusivity or just outright ownership of the pub. Ties have existed since at least 1750, but one can argue that the practice was not particularly widespread, though exact numbers are hard to come by. Because of the ties' nature, it can be difficult to count how many tied houses there were, Speculative estimates say that in 1870, somewhere around 50% of the UK's pubs were tied, probably less than more. The 1869 Act changed the way the brewers felt that they had to do business. 
First, despite a booming population, the number of pubs was actually shrinking. The magistrates quickly exercised their new privileges, with the number of licenses declining 20% from 1869 to 1904. And new licenses were rarely granted, as each pub faced considerable opposition from the temperance movement. Second, simply issuing out a mortgage to a tied house or its operator was no longer enough to maintain its quality and avoid closure. The brewers needed to get more involved in their direct operations. And finally, third, beer consumption per capita peaked in the mid-1870s. This was in part due to the aforementioned temperance movement, but also because people's tastes were shifting. So to sum it up, by the 1880s, the breweries realized that their domestic market was shrinking and that their best tactic to lock in their share of that market was in tied houses. But the supply of such tied houses was limited. Thus, the breweries began spending massive sums of money acquiring tied houses in good locations before their competitors could. This was fueled by capital raised in the emerging stock and debt markets. On October 25, 1886, Guinness went public, raising £6 million. The listing was massively oversubscribed, closed in just an hour. Others followed. All the tied houses these breweries acquired raised their total assets, which then helped collateralize more borrowing for yet even more acquisitions. The flywheel was now in motion. In 1892, 76 breweries in England and Wales each owned over 100 houses outright. The top 11 had 200-plus properties, and if you count leases and contracts, that number grows yet further. And this was before the boom hit its peak in the late 1890s. Between 1895 and 1902, the brewers were buying 500 leases a year, lending out the entire purchase price in a surefire sign of an overheated market. Some of these breweries looked more like property firms than beer companies. For instance, in a period in late 1888, the George's Bristol Brewery was acquiring two dozen pubs a month. They eventually got to 380 houses owned and another 120 leased. Pointing out the local monopoly that each pub possessed, CEA George's was quoted in an 1889 stockholders meeting, A tied trade was an absolutely safe trade, a safe dividend-paying trade for the proprietors. Prices were craziest in London, but even in provinces, things got wild. In 1896, the Ord Arms pub was sold. The pub was strategically located across from a new factory by Armstrong Whitworth, a big manufacturer, and was sold for £28,100. To compare, you can buy a good mansion and 700 acres of land in the same county, the Twizel Estate, for just £25,000, worth or about £3.7 million today. By the end of the frenzy in 1906, nearly 90% of all the UK's pubs were tied and the brewers now had big real estate portfolios worth a substantial portion of their overall asset value. After a series of mergers in the 1960s, six very large national brewer retailers emerged. Those six were Allied Lions, Bass, Courage, Grand Metropolitan slash Watney Man, Scottish and Newcastle, and Whitbread. Out of the 220 brewers in the country in 1986, the Big Six produced 75% of its total beer. By the late 1980s, 80% 80 of all the pubs in Britain were tied to a brewery. The Big Six by themselves had 75% of all those tied pubs. The families owning these massive brewers were referred to as the Beerage, an amusing play on words. The tied houses made up a substantial portion of their overall wealth about 65% of their total asset value. There is little argument that the tied house system looked quite troublesome. In 1969, near the end of this huge wave of horizontal mergers and consolidations that produced the Big Six, the Monopolies Commission issued a report saying that the tied house system worked against the public interest. The report said that the system restrained competition since any insurgent beer brand needed to be in the pubs to gain scale and that wasn't possible thanks to the tied houses. Furthermore, it seemed like the modern brewers and distributors didn't need tied houses to compete. But the system was complicated, and in the end, the British government and public at the time felt that breaking the ties would not benefit the pub tenants nor the customers. So in the end, they relaxed the granting of licenses and left things largely alone. Two decades later, the atmosphere began to shift. 
Consumer tastes were changing. Spending on spirits, wine, and cedar tripled from 1968 to 1987, while beer grew by just 15%. Beer imports grew, especially in the premium bottled sector. British beer production continued its decline, 41.7 million barrels in 1979 to 33.5 million in 1993. And yet for that, the big six brewers continued to dominate the market. By 1976, the seven largest beer companies had 82% market share, sparking concerns of a cartel. Another report by the Monopolies Commission in 1979 said that the industry had the classic conditions for a monopoly which is likely to operate to the detriment of consumers. That was because beer prices continued to stay high, rising at rates beyond that of inflation despite negative trends. The brewers' aggressive price strategy, which included a 4.8% increase in 1985-1986 alone, carried consumer dissatisfaction. Combine that with some of the highest taxes and duties on beer in all of Europe, which themselves rose by 59% between 1979 and 1993, and you have a difficult situation. In 1986, the Conservative British government commissioned another report from the Monopolies and Mergers Commission. It was issued in 1989. The report made its point very clear. The tied house system was a monopoly and hurt the consumer. We have unanimously concluded that a monopoly exists in favor of those brewers who own tied houses or who have tying agreements with free houses in return for loans at favorable interest rates. The report's primary recommendation, and the heart of what we call the 1989 beer orders, was that the national brewers be restricted from owning over 2,000 pubs. Selling this massively valuable real estate portfolio, estimated to be worth £10 billion at the time, seemed unthinkable. After heavy lobbying, the divestment order was modified to only divesting half of the pubs over the 2,000 pub threshold. A second major effect of the beer orders was the ban ties based on loans between the brewers and the pubs. Existing loans could be grandfathered in. And finally, the beer orders allowed the tenant operators of the pubs to sell at least one beer that is not the landlord's, the guest beer, which is a funny phrase. As before, the brewers rose up against the beer orders. The brewers funded a publicity campaign accusing the Secretary of State for Trade and Industry at the time, Lord Young, of destroying more pubs than the Luftwaffe had. They argued that the tied house system was in the public interest because it incentivized the brewers to invest in improving the pub's facilities. That money contributed to local character. Pub owners, unable to sell other products or cut prices, competed on amenities, spending that extra pound for the right ambiance they felt their customers wanted. As I mentioned earlier, the pub experience is not about getting the absolute cheapest beer. It is a social gathering place. Pub customers will always grumble about prices, but it's not what they're there for. A 1989 survey by the Consumers Association found that only a small percentage of people cared about the price of their pub's beer, though that same survey also found that those same customers were visiting pubs less because of it. But the British government had tapped a popular issue. Who doesn't want cheaper beer? The tabloids buzzed about increased competition bringing down beer prices and more choices in the pubs. And then there was the European Commission, which would have banned the tied house system anyway were it not for the UK's block exemption regulations. And the EC was soon to review whether the tied houses fell into that exemption. The block exemption is supposed to only apply to certain critical industries like food and telecom, not beer. And finally, the tied house system was a complex product of antiquity, which didn't fit the atmosphere of the 1980s. Thus, the government moved forward in the name of public interest. Cheaper beers, more choice, and overall reform. The beer orders shook up the industry during a generally disruptive time. In the United Kingdom during the 1990s, real disposable income growth was limited, especially for the middle and lower classes. Unemployment rates stayed rather high, and house prices went into the stratosphere. The demographic changes of the last few decades, shifting people away from beer, continued on. The British population got older and their tastes more fickle, with new credible options for their nights, like the TV and VCR. And in the midst of these headwinds, the Big Six were given three years, 1992 
to sell off what was estimated at the time to be over 11,000 of their pubs. The final number was 14,000. The choice then for the big six was to choose retail or brewing. Which one do you want to do? Several exited the beer brewing business entirely. Grand Metropolitan and Allied Lions pivoted to focusing on the international spirits industry before the 1992 deadline. The former, Grand Metropolitan, in a very complicated 1991 asset swap deal with Courage, who bought their breweries. The latter, Allied, eventually exited the brewing business with a series of transactions, divesting them in 1992 to a joint venture with Carlsberg, maker of Carlsberg Beer, to create Carlsberg Tetley Limited. Bass sold off their pubs and then sold their brewing business to Interbrew, the Belgian owner of Stella Artois, though the British government later overturned that deal in 2001, so Interbrew eventually resold Bass to Coors. Whitbread decided to exit beer brewing after 258 years to become a retail and leisure dining chain, adding thousands more pubs and outlets in a 1999 deal with Allied. And later, in 2007, Scottish and Newcastle was swallowed up by two European competitors, Heineken and Carlsberg, for nearly £8 billion. Despite this round of musical chairs, the beer industry remained extremely consolidated. In 1989, the Big Six had 78% of the market. By 1995, the remaining Big Four, Carlsberg Tetley Limited, Bass, Whitbread, and Scottish and Newcastle, had 84% market share. If the intention of the beer orders was to build up more independent pubs by severing that vertical link to the brewers, then the beer orders failed. What instead emerged were large independent pub operating companies, pub codes. They were kind of like the theater chains over in America, owning and running large numbers of pubs. In 2004, the two largest pub codes, Enterprise Inns and Punch Taverns, owned over 60% of the pubs in the UK essentially creating a horizontal monopoly. To compare, prior to 1989, the two largest of the big six controlled just 40%. The pub codes were often backed by financial players seeking to pull off a role of play, and for that reason, they struggled quite mightily after the global financial crisis, when land values fell and debt became toxic. It is, in general, a difficult business. One of the widely publicized goals of the beer orders were to reduce the prices of beer in the pubs. These hopes were frustrated as well. The price of a pint of beer at the pub has continued to rise at higher than the rate of inflation. The gap between beer sold at retail and at wholesale widened in the 20 years after the beer orders. The price dynamics of beer as it goes from wholesale to retail turned out to be much more complicated than first grasped. The pubcos were able to extract wholesale discounts from the brewers as expected but were not able to pass those savings on. In some cases, they added their own margins onto the pub tenant's beer costs, a practice called the wet rent. There are other reasons for the rising margins too. Policymakers have pointed out the costs of needed improvements to the locales, rising wages for bar staff, and an inability to automate either of those things. On the question of consumer choice, that has turned out much better. Pubs used to offer just beer and only a certain type of beer, too. Now pubs offer a wider range of beer, and they have introduced food options. To compete, pubs have started catering to certain niches, so now you have pubs more favorable to families, pets, students, non-smokers slash smokers, and so on. Unfortunately, the number of pubs has continued to decline, despite the population growing through most of the decade. Stressed by high rents, rougher economic times, and competition from other locations selling beer, pub tenants have ditched the job. This trend is especially prevalent in the villages, where as early as 1997, 38% of the country's villages did not have a pub of their own. The beer and pub industries continue to evolve. Changing consumer tastes and international competition have continued the push towards consolidation. The top three players, Heineken, AB InBev, and Molson, have half of the market in 2020. Breaking the Tide House system might have been unavoidable considering the forthcoming European Commission reviews, but the government perhaps should have re-examined their assumptions of what might happen with the beer orders. The lower prices and increased competition did not happen, and for the pubs, removing one dominant overseer only brought up another.
All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you guys next time.